So today I'm joined by Dr. David Katz, a physician and the founding director of Yale Griffin Prevention Research Center and the CEO of Diet ID, which is a new digital dietary intake assessment tool. David, welcome. Thank you, Scott. Great to be with you. All right. So you've been referred as the poet laureate of health promotion. And <laughs> both of us know that nutrition, wealth management, and the prevention of chronic disease are important. Yet many of us continue to still struggle. And why is that? Because knowing what isn't the same as knowing how. And th the simple fact is, Scott, I'm not aware of any place in the world where a country runs on Duncan, where junk is a food group, and where people eat well and are healthy because their doctors give them great advice or because they know that vegetables are good for them. The, the simple fact is, at the population level, we find great health where culture delivers it, where eating well is normal, everybody does it. So for example, traditional Mediterranean diets in Mediterranean countries where everybody just eats that way, and physical activity in European villages where everybody walks much of the time and has a garden. So, so it's really difficult in our culture to get to health, and the minority of people have the necessary willpower and skill power. I, I would say that if you live in a culture that doesn't make healthy eating, healthy living easy, the burden is more on you as an individual to have a high level of skill power. And, and some people have it. I, I have it. I imagine you have it. I'm supposed to have it. I'm a preventive medicine specialist. If I didn't have it, who would? That doesn't make me a special person any more than being able to fly a plane makes a pilot a special person. It just means they have a skill set that most of us don't have. Same here. So that's the issue. You know, I think, I think most of us know that fruits and vegetables are good for us. Um, but getting there from here, making a healthy diet, our daily routine is hard. Being physically active in a world awash in labor-saving technology and really hectic schedules is hard. Managing stress in such a stressful world is hard. Getting enough sleep when there's such demands in our time is hard. All of these things are difficult. And, and so um, until we make them easier, until we make it normal in our culture to eat well, be active, manage stress, get enough sleep, all, all the good stuff, uh, it's only going to be the minority who get there from here. And, and that's a shame. We can do better. So, so, David, I want to focus on your point about culture because I think this is uh, really fascinating. So, for example, when I visited Japan uh, to do some, some work uh, with some of the businesses there, I found that whenever I ate out, the portions were very small. And, of course, it's high in vegetables, uh, fish, and, and the omega-3 as an example. But culturally, they, they kind of teach the population to abide or comply with smaller portion intake. Um, and then similarly, you know, when you think about the Scandinavian countries where they just don't get the same amount of sunlight, where they would normally be vitamin D deficient and could actually affect their skeletal growth and so forth, they've learned to actually consume more cod and preserve fish as an example. So culture has a lot to do with the fact that I think we become healthy as a group. When we treat health and nutrition as kind of an individual battle, now we're kind of trying to overcome habits which are kind of sticky and difficult to change. Yeah, all good points, Scott, really good points. Um, what's the expression in Japanese for stop eating when 80% full? You I, know, I know what you're saying. but Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, a, it, a, you know, it's, a, it's attached to Okinawa in particular. And, um, you know, Okinawa is one of the, the five identified blue zones in the world where people routinely live to be 100 and don't tend to get chronic disease. So absolutely, culture delivers those blessings, if you will. And I think it is a lot to ask of individuals to overcome a culture that isn't delivering health. On the other hand, I, you know, I, I think we can't just keep waiting on the world to change. So individuals are obligated to try and... Uh, obtain the necessary skill set to be healthy. You know, people do that for lots of reasons. We all learn to read. It wasn't easy in the beginning, learning the alphabet, learning how to read. It was hard work. Learning math was hard work. These are skills you need throughout life. So you say, okay, this is important. I'm going to do this. Learning to ride a bike. You know, we all fell off and skinned our knees a few times, but eventually we got it right. So I, I would say healthy living takes skill in, in most modern cultures, and we have to try to get there from here. The sad fact is, you're right, 
traditionally about Japan. But on the other hand, there's McDonald's in Japan and there's KFC in Japan. <laughs> and so, you know, little by little, we are effectively exporting all of our bad habits all around the world. You know that the Mediterranean diet is going away in Mediterranean countries as they start to eat the same fast food we do. So the question is, you know, will the, the modern junkie diet and the high pressure modern lifestyle become the default in modernized countries all around the world? Or can culture in, in traditional cultures around the world withstand that? It's not yet clear how that's going to play out. It, it doesn't look too good, to be quite honest. So it may be that little by little, all the bad habits prevail. And then we look at that and say, no, no, we've got to fix this. And then all of us rally and say, we really need to adopt the health promoting practices that used to be part of traditional cultures and we let them slip away. That's a, that's a really great point. Let's shift from kind of the qualitative aspect to more quantitative. Uh, one of the uh, points that you mentioned to me before we started recording was that nutrition is actually a vital sign. Uh, in addition to that, you've created this index called the Overall Nutritional Quality Index using the Nouveau Nutritional Guidance System. What is it and why does it work and why do we need to quantify it? Yeah, so, so right, so my, my statement is diet is a vital sign. And what I mean by that is if you objectively measure diet quality, and, and that's done with tools like the Healthy Eating Index 2015, so you can stratify diet quality and you can put people into quintiles, it correlates powerfully with the total risk of all major chronic diseases, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, dementia, et cetera, and with all-cause mortality. And so, you know, frankly, when you think about what vital signs do, they tell you the state of your health and they tell you what's likely to happen next. Well, diet truly is a vital sign. It's vital to everything important about health outcomes. But we almost never measure diet because it's just too hard. Food frequency questionnaires take 60 to 90 minutes and require you to remember everything you've eaten in the past six months. 24-hour recalls require you to remember everything you ate yesterday. Seven-day food diaries require that you write down everything you eat for a full week. Tedious, time-consuming, labor-intensive, etc. So I run a startup company called Diet ID. Uh, we have completely reinvented dietary assessments so that it can be done in under a minute. It's easy. It's fun. It's not memory dependent. It's all about pattern recognition. It, it, it's as simple as what happens when you get these sorted out. You go to the eye doctor. You look through a device called a phoropter. They show you two images. One is clear and one is blurry, and it's your job to say which is which. And then when you pick, now that's the clear one, they say, okay, how about now, and you do it again. We've done that for diet. And, and this is my latest invention. We've been developing this for the past several years. People can learn more at dietid.com. It follows uh, about a decade ago, a little more now, um, my efforts to develop a nutrient profiling system. That was called NuVal. And that was about individual food. So one to 100, the higher the number, the more nutritious the food. I, I worked with a whole team of experts that time and this time. Um, we developed a very sophisticated algorithm that considered all of the various nutrient inputs and weighted them for their health effects. That was called the Overall Nutritional Quality Index, or the Anki. Uh, we have a number of peer-reviewed papers on the topic of the Anki. Uh, and, you know, 30 pages of mind-numbing computer programming later out popped the number. The higher the number, the more nutritious the food. And that was deployed in supermarkets throughout the United States. Uh, in that instance, I was the lead scientist and, and the lead engineer, if you will, of the algorithm, but I didn't have any direct control over the business. And I think the business model had some serious limitations. And so NuVal tends not to be available anymore, sadly. Uh, I hope to bring it back at some point. Uh, but I learned my lesson, right? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So I wasn't inclined to get fooled twice the same way. So in the case of Diet ID, I decided, okay, I'm, I'm the lead scientist again. I'm going to run the company. And so I, you know, I really shifted my career at this point uh, to the private sector, to, to being an entrepreneur. And it's my hope that Diet ID can help millions upon millions add years to life and life to years by providing clarity on what your diet is now, what you'd like it to be, the route from here to there, and your progress along the way, just like GPS. You know, the GPS does four things. Where am I now? Where do I want to go? How do I get there from here? And how am I doing? Uh, diet ID does all four things. And so uh, you know, we're really 
looking forward to deploying that widely and making a major contribution to public health. Great, David. Now let's talk about the diet quality photo navigation patent pending technology and some of the algorithms that you're referencing. Are you using uh, machine learning or deep learning? Uh, is it uh, image recognition? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. So DQPN or diet quality photo navigation, that's the method we invented that, that powers Diet ID. So Diet ID is, is the name of, of the app and, and the program that people can access. Uh, but the method is diet quality photo navigation. And absolutely, uh, it's powered by machine learning and artificial intelligence. As we deploy with larger and larger populations, we learn about um, what works best for whom and constantly evolve the product. I think that's true with most, most digital offerings. And it's one of the advantages of digitally deployed health promotion is the deployment and the learning system are effectively one and the same if you capture the data and kind of channel them back through and you're continuously then evolving your offering and making it better and better. But there are a couple of inspirations for the method. The first I already described and that's the Feropter. So, you know, I, I, I was literally working out on the elliptical one day and reflecting on the frustrations of assessing diet. So diet is a vital sign, but it's the vital sign we never measure. And as you know, Scott, that there's an expression from the business world, we don't tend to manage what we don't measure. You know, you know you've got to know what something is to, to deal effectively with it. So we all know that diet is so massively important, but we hardly ever measure it. And consequently, we rarely manage it effectively. And it's frustrating in research. It's frustrating in clinical care. I, I've been, for most of my career, an academic triathlete teaching, research, and patient care. And in all those contexts, not having good information about diet was rate limiting and frustrating. So I, I just, I don't know whether I had been to the eye doctor recently or what, but I was just, you know, working out thinking, you know, imagine if you went to the eye doctor and you had to fill out a 50 page questionnaire that took an hour and a half about how you think you see at different times of day and different kinds of light. And then somebody had to go through all of that and try to figure out from that, okay, you know, what glasses do you need? It would be horrible. And the glasses would only sort of fit. But you don't do anything like that. You actually look through lenses at images. They, that one's clear. That one's blurry. And you get a perfect match for your eyes. Imagine if we did that for diet. That was the original epiphany. And then I started thinking about how that could be done. And diet quality photo navigation was the result. The idea that we could develop fully realized dietary prototypes, stratified by type and quality, turn them into an image, a collected image of the foods that make up breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, drinks for several days. And we could display those in an app and ask people which looks more like stuff you eat, this or this. The, the other thing that inspired this was Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in Blink, Gladwell describes the fact that some, you know, we, we tend to overthink, that, that very often that initial impression is really powerful. I think, you know, every high-performing student knows about this. You take a standardized test and you, you answer the question. It's probably right. And then you go back and, you know, you change the answer because you think too much about it and you change it from right to wrong. I think we've all been there. So in Blink, Gladwell says, you know, the, that, that pattern recognition that inspires an initial response, really, really powerful. We've harnessed the power of that to help people identify their current diet, to help them identify their goal diet, and, and to make it all visual and vivid. People are really bad, Scott, at, at recalling details. Detailed recollection is, is not a human strength. There's so many psychology experiments that, you know, they'll, they'll show some crazy scene, you know, people in gorilla suits come through the scene and then they ask you afterwards, what did you see? And everybody in the room describes something different. But pattern recognition, we're really, really good at. We have to be. We're social animals. We need to recognize faces. And so we kind of flipped the switch and said, forget about recalling the details of diet. Let's make this about pattern recognition, totally change the game. And so that's, that's the methodology at the heart of Diet ID. And because we're using machine learning, as the population exposed grows, the data available to inform the system and make it ever better at delivering to people the cues they need to make the right choices, that will evolve continuously. So, so David, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, so basically they get a visual cue of what is kind of the best practice or the best breakfast, lunch, and meal. And that's something that they start to, over time, try to follow as a kind of a guide. Well, uh, sort of, sort of. It, it, it's actually, it's simpler than that, really. You know, the key thing at the beginning, Scott, is, is figuring out what is your diet now? You know, if you want to draw a line, you need two points. 
So the line from your current diet to your goal diet has mm -hmm. to be informed by where are you now and where do you want to go? So the where are you now part has been really, really hard to get. What is your current diet? So I'm sure you've had your blood pressure measured. Everybody has. I'm sure you could say ballpark what your blood pressure was the last time it was measured. But can you say what the objective quality score of your diet was? No, nobody can because nobody's had it measured. You know, the, the number of people who have is a rounding error. Well, diet's the most important predictor of health outcomes. That's got to change. So, so again, we ask you a few questions. Do you eat meat, yes or no? Do you eat poultry, yes or no? Do you eat fish, yes or no? Do you eat grains, yes or no? We ask you a few questions. Say, so, okay, we know enough about you. Here are two images of fully realized diets on your, on your smartphone screen. Which of these looks more like stuff you eat? And you pick and you pick and you pick again. In under a minute, we've got you. And then we say, okay, do you have any health goals? Do you want to reduce inflammation? Do you want to avoid diabetes? Do you want to lose weight? Do you want, are you worried about heart disease? And we then say, okay, well, here are some images of diets that are specifically recommended for your health goals. Which of these looks most appealing? Say that one. Yeah. And then you, you know, you're making a decision not just based on this is the kind of diet you should have, but actually looking at foods that you think, yeah, I'd be willing to eat that. My family would be willing to eat that. So you know, it's, it's, because it's visual, it's, it's a much more informative interaction than just telling you, oh, you have high blood pressure, you should have the DASH diet. And you say, okay, I don't really know what the DASH diet means. We actually show you an image of these are the kinds of foods you'll be eating. Does that work for you? And if not, let's pick a diet where you say, yeah, these kinds of foods do work for me and my family because, you know, we often say about exercise, the, what's the best exercise? The kind you'll do. Well, the same is really too, true about diet. There are lots of different variations on the theme of eating well. And the one that's best for you is the one that you'll actually practice. Otherwise, this is just a very theoretical discussion. Yeah. Yeah. I really like the approach that you're taking, which is it used to be that things were kind of metadata centric, very, you know, uh, medical and, and prescriptive set of things. But here you're providing something kind of a mass appeal. The fact that it's visual makes it just much more intuitive because people are uh, curating and documenting their food and travel journey on places like Instagram, as an example. Is there a thought in the future as far as a product roadmap to consider an API integration with, say, like Instagram, where you're also teaching the machine learning the other way, which is you're pulling in the selfies with maybe the, the photos of their dinners or their meals, and you're learning how they're eating, how that actually uh, compares to the selection that they made. So you're kind of getting a sense in terms of the compliance and the enforcement aspects of it. Absolutely, yes. It's a great point. And, and to be honest, I hadn't thought specifically about Instagram. It's a great suggestion. But yes, so, so Diet ID is developed as an open API. And the whole idea here is that this can be integrated into a wide variety of other platforms. We realized early, you know, we, we were not inventing dietary change. We were not inventing behavior change. There are a lot of great entities, a, a lot of great individuals working on coaching people to eat better. That part's out there. That part is deployed digitally. Um, so the idea that, well, yeah, we can develop our own specific approach to behavioral navigation, but on the other hand, we can also integrate into systems that already do that. And then we can pull in data from those other sources. So yes, an Instagram integration is a really interesting suggestion, and, and we haven't thought specifically about that. But we have thought about integration with a variety of platforms where you're uploading an image, you know, here's my lunch, how is it? So although we're about the overall journey, here's your current diet, here's your goal diet, it can be informed by here's what I had for lunch today, how does that fit in? And then absolutely the system can learn from those images and can tailor the guidance from where you need to go based on the specific input you're providing. There, there, there are all sorts of ways to evolve this really the limits of imagination. The technology is not limiting, as you know. It, you know, it, it really lets us do almost anything we can think to do these days. David, I want to transition this conversation because the, the topic of nutrition, weight management, uh, individually is incredibly important for health and longevity and the quality of life. But uh, on a grander scale, it also has a bigger impact to climate change, meaning our consumption behavior or choices that we make on a daily basis affects planet Earth. How do, we tie, how do we correlate that? And more importantly, how can individual action and choices change all, over time that actually benefits our environment? Hugely important. Very quick backstory, Scott. One of my best friends and, and one of the few friends I've retained all the way since high school is a wildlife veterinarian and a conservationist. And, and over the years, he's sort of been teasing me, but he wasn't entirely joking, asking me, are you sure you're on the right team? 
because as a, as a public health physician, I've been working hard to add years to lives and life to years to homo sapiens. And homo sapiens are destroying the planet. So, you know, he's been asking me, you sure you're on the right team? The beauty of lifestyle medicine, and that's really become my field, leveraging diet, lifestyle practices to promote health, to treat disease, to prevent disease. Um, the beauty of it is it's entirely confluent with what we need to do for the, the health of the planet. So, you know, the, the, the best diets are mostly plants without a question. So if you mostly eat minimally processed vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, lentils, nuts, and seeds, and mostly drink plain water when thirsty, your diet can't be too far wrong. And if you don't do that, it can't be too far right. Well, those are all the things you need to do to massively benefit the planet. Um, you know, if you're willing to give up beef entirely, so much the better because the environmental impacts of beef are very, very high. But if you minimize the processing in your diet, and one obvious example, drink water, not soda. It takes up to 600 liters of water to produce one liter of soda in a plastic bottle. Just drink water in a thirsty world. Um, so less processing, less packaging, and less animal food, more plant food. Those few changes, if we did that at scale, massive benefit to the planet. And by the way, all the exact same things we would recommend to you if you want to avoid obesity, heart disease, diabetes, stroke, cancer, dementia. It didn't have to be that way. You know, it might have been that the best diet for human health and the best diet for biodiversity, aquifers, climate, planet were different. That'd be really too bad. We'd have a tough choice to make. They're the same. And, and the same is true, of course, with locomotion. The more locomotion that we do under our own power rather than by burning fossil fuel, the better. So get a bike you know, when you can, use your feet, pedal, walk, get around that way, um, drive less. So it, it's, it's really very highly confluent. And I've been interested in the overlap for much of the past decade now. And, and I, I've started telling my colleagues in the health professions, you really can't call yourself a health professional in 2019 if you're not advocating frequently and fiercely for the health of the planet. Because at the end of it all, there are no healthy people on a ruined planet. This is our common home. We have to take care of it if we want to take care of ourselves. So even just as a public health physician, forgetting that you know I've got kids and I care about the fate of the Amazon and all that just because I'm a citizen of the world, but just as a public health physician, just focusing on my vocation, I must advocate fiercely for stabilizing climate change, for protecting biodiversity, for preserving aquifers, because without those things, there will be no healthy people. There'll be no health left to protect. So it's the same lifestyle practices, and, and that's a really fortuitous thing. Now, David, uh, I want to just talk about one last subject, and then we'll wrap it up for today, is, uh, is a nonprofit that you created called the Truth Initiative. Tell us what it is, and what's the purpose, and how are you using that vehicle to exactly what you're talking about, which is the fact that our healthy diet that ultimately affects the environment as well. So the True Health Initiative, it's a 501c3. And I, I formed it, Scott, in, in response to an impression I had, which turned into a hypothesis. I, I'm fortunate that over 30 years of work in this space, I've gotten to know everybody else who's working in this space, all the, the leading experts in diet and lifestyle and nutrition around the world. And going to conferences with these people, it, it, it was very obvious to me that real experts in nutrition all eat more alike than different. So they may sound very different when they're on the Today Show. You know, the, the vegan experts sound like they're saying very different things from the paleo experts and very different from the Mediterranean diet experts. But then you're all together at a conference and you're in the lunch line and everybody's plate looks a lot alike. So, you know, the, the vegan experts have a big plate of greens and their protein source is, you know, the beans or lentils. And the paleo experts have the same big plate of greens and where the lentils went, they've got some wild salmon, for example, or, or bison. Um, but those plates are more like one another and less like the typical American diet than the typical American knows. So the idea of the True Health Initiative was, can I get these people to admit that? Can I ask the experts from vegan to paleo and everything in between to come together and say, we actually agree about 95% of everything. It's just that you only ever hear us talk on TV about the 5%. And the answer was yes. So, so the True Health Initiative is a pooling of the world's experts in diet, lifestyle, health promotion, disease prevention. We have about 500 world-leading experts, three former surgeons general of the United States, chairs of departments, deans of schools, CEOs of healthcare institutions, leading health journalists like Sanjay Gupta, leading nutrition writers, leading chefs, uh, about 500 experts from 42 countries. 
and again, ranging all the way from vegan to paleo, coming together to say we agree. And I think that's hugely important because so much of the health news these days is is fractious. You know, it, it, it's a he said, she said. And of course, the media love that because then you have to tune in tomorrow to get yet another opinion. But what we wanted to do was say, actually, there is massive global consensus among experts about the science and the sensible interpretation of it. And you can trust the True Health Initiative when you're not sure who to trust because it's not one person's opinion. It is the consensus view of a who's who in public health. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. There's a lot more that we need to discuss, uh, but we can't fit it into this. <laughs> so how can people follow your work as well as Diet ID? Okay. Well, thank you very much. That's been a pleasure. And yeah, maybe we, maybe we do a part two sometime. So my website is davidkatzmd.com, and it's kind of one-stop shopping. All the stuff I do, there are links to it there. Uh, the True Health Initiative has its own dedicated site. That's truehealthinitiative.org. And then finally, Diet ID, which is a for-profit company. And, you know, we'd certainly love to hear from people who are interested in learning more about that. Just go to dietid.com. Today, I've been joined by Dr. David Katz, a physician and the founder and CEO of Diet ID. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. 